I'm Mike Moran. I'm the second half of the duo from Duo. Uh, and today I'm going to be talking about uh, the device registration attacks against identity, effectively what can happen before, uh, before some of the stuff that Becca just talked about. Uh, so what I mean by device registration, device registration is the initial step uh, when you are associating an MFA device, this might be your roaming authenticator like your phone, biometric device, what have you, to your account. Once you do that, then that device can be used to confirm uh, those MFA attempts in the future. Uh, and that trust in that MFA device comes from the chain of trust from whatever started uh, that identity proofing. Uh, if you ever went to, uh, had to show like your passport and ID when you started a new job, identity proofing. Uh, in the day and age that we are at, that's not always possible, uh, both due to COVID as well as you know large-scale enrollment events like a college starting a new semester. It's impossible for them to go through and check every single thing. So sometimes that identity proofing relies on other forms, uh, like access to an email account or a particular network. And you can probably see where, where this can happen. If an attacker can, can get into that network and, and provide possibly just a first factor alone, they could register a device uh, if it's not secured. Additionally, there can be those cases uh, similar to what Becca just talked about, where uh, an adversary tries to prompt or social engineer someone to confirm uh, a push request or something else to confirm their identity, and then they get to register their own device. Uh, so there are these multiple different points of, of human uh, inter interaction that can lead to, to the initial compromise. Um, and the reason why this is so uh, so critical is that once you get past the MFA system, uh, the systems that you're trying to access, these might be your databases, your internal wikis, source code, what have you, uh, they don't know, uh, you know what's going on. They just see, hey, this, this was allowed through. So an adversary that has enrolled their own MFA device looks exactly the same. And that can do a lot of damage, especially because once they get into that network and get in those systems, uh, they could immediately start exfiltrating data. And if you don't have other defenses in place or, or a slow response time, uh, then there can be a lot of harm. What we want to do is try to identify those devices at the time they are registered uh, and not wait until the activity that comes after in order to, to identify it. Um, this is an attack that's of growing concern. Um, it was recently added to MITRE ATT&CK uh, earlier this year, uh, if you haven't read it. Uh, and that addition was partially because of recent high-profile breaches like the CISA alert, like an attack against Cisco itself uh, earlier this year that Talos put out a great report on recently. Um, so this is becoming one of those new frontiers of, while MFA is highly secure and there are these aspects, there's this human element that we need to, uh, need to address as well. Uh, there's obviously a lot you can do, and I think everyone here is already thinking of ways like how they would do this in their own system or try to protect this. Uh, and there should be a multifaceted, robust approach to detection that uses a whole bunch of different things. But when you're trying to move really fast and provide real uh, security value to a variety of customers in a whole bunch of different situa situations might be difficult to understand or know uh, what's going to be the best to start with. Um, and our approach was to define these simple security and risk-based heuristics uh, to surface some of those enrollment events for the security analysts at the teams uh, so that they could uh, do further triage. I'll give an example from a recent compromise as well. Uh, one of our customers had an employee at their company doing work. They had MFA enabled. Everything was set up fine. And then that employee left the company. During the deprovisioning process, their MFA devices were removed, but their account wasn't deactivated. Uh, so that account existed within their active directory until an adversary comes along and says, hey, well, I've uh, you know cracked their first factor for credentials, and this customer has not had any other identity proofing set up. So that's all I need to register an MFA device. So the chain of trust is broken uh, because... Oh, um, because uh, there hasn't been the strong identity proofing that was relaxed uh, to provide a better user experience for the uh, for the employees as they onboard, uh, but this small security lapse at the company led led to this compromise. Um, there's a bunch of different ways that you could you could look at this. Uh, what we decided to look at was just how long since the last successful authentication uh, between that and this registration attempt. Um, you're probably thinking in your head. There's a lot of different ways that that could come up. Um, 
uh, in, in benign situations. Uh, but uh, since we don't have uh, visibility into the internals of that like user uh, active directory, we just know that the account is active, uh, we need to use some of these other heuristics. Uh, in combination with that, we also looked at the security state of the roaming authenticator, especially phones and tablets. Um, if you look at this list, you're probably thinking like, yeah, why wouldn't you like check for that immediately? Um, or why wouldn't you just disable that immediately? In some cases, uh, companies do not want to do that. It's increased friction. Uh, you know, some people won't want a company telling them like, hey, make sure you have, uh, you know, your unrooted device uh, for, uh, for working here, um, uh, especially in like universities as well. Uh, they have less control over those device properties, but those are still a real risk to the company, uh, even if they are allowed by uh, by the policy set in place by that security team. Um, as as Becca mentioned, this is still you know a very sparse uh, labor population. So I've mentioned a couple of different. Um, events uh, from earlier this year. Within that data set, we have 11 known positives. Uh, that's out of about 6 million new phones that were registered in the first half of this year. Um, so instead of looking at just those, we look at like a proxy label of when that device was removed after the fact. Um, so in this case, uh, if a device is removed early on, uh, it's probably because of the incident response team at that company. Uh, that's not always necessarily the case. That could happen because someone is doing testing and I'm, I'm registering and removing my phone to check a new workflow or to make sure that I'm set up before you know the new suite of students comes on. Um, but we can say that's probably a decent proxy label. It's about 3% of our data set. That's probably an upper level for how many device registration attacks there have been uh, this last year. Um, you can also see some other artifacts within the timing. Definitely interesting to look into, uh, but we won't go into that uh, today. So what, what does this mean? Uh, and hopefully I've given enough uh, caveats at this point that the next slide will not surprise you. Uh, the precision against that, uh, that proxy metric is 5.83%. If there's an award for lowest precision in Camel's talk, I will gladly accept it. Um, and 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 as 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 Becca kind of talked about, what we care more about almost is is that experience. So if we alert on only ten percent of those enrollments, that might mean that a security analyst only needs to check that dashboard once every two weeks instead of every single day. Uh, or in cases where you know a thousand new students show up, they need to go through a hundred uh, of those events, not all a thousand. For these overtaxed um, security analyst teams that might not even have security as their primary job title, uh, that can save a lot of effort. Um, uh, we do with the benefit all of those true positive events are identified by these heuristics too. So. Uh, there is some grounds for uh, for looking at what the real attack data is and not just us saying what's going on. So what we gain from this, uh, we've encoded real security risks uh, into, uh, into this simple detection system, a couple simple rules uh, that produce these actionable alerts. Uh, and that leads to our customers hopefully improving the security of their own systems. Uh, if, if we think back to what those are, Let's make sure that our uh, user accounts are fully de de uh, deprovisioned uh, during offboarding process. Let's make sure that we, uh, you know, think about disabling uh, or disallowing tampered devices or outdated operating systems and moving them forward so that uh, they not only, uh, you know, stop the the potential attacks now, but they're in a more secure state in the future to prevent future ones. Uh, and with that, I will take any questions.